Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. Today we're doing something a bit different from the usual. This is a video collaboration between me, you know me, you know my face, that's why it's so small in the in the screen. Sam, you cannot see it, but my face is very <laughs> small, your face is very big. <laughs> and Mr. Sam Mazzeo. Mazzeo is an Italian name. Yeah, you pronounced it correctly. Usually people say Mazio or Mazeo. Mazzeo is correct. You are a partner of Wilkmatz, which is yeah. a legal firm based in San Diego, if I don't mistake. Right. Now, I would like you to introduce yourself because obviously this only scratches the surface. Do it and then I have to show my viewers your website because you are the only lawyer that I know that has merch. <laughs> Yeah, sounds good. So, <clears throat> yeah, my name's Sam Mazio. I am uh, one of the partners at Wilkmaz, and we are a small boutique law firm that serves nonprofits, creatives, and also small businesses and startups. Um, we got our start because my business partner, Emily Wilkinson, and I actually worked at a nonprofit organization that used to be based here in San Diego called Invisible Children. Some people might remember the Coney 2012 video back in 2012. And so, we worked there for about a year and a half together and then started our law firm uh, because Invisible Children was well, shutting down its San Diego office and going to focus on lobbying in D.C. And since then, we have really tried to create a practice that really is an extension of us and not the traditional practice of law where it's, you know, ivory tower, old white guy in a three piece suit and they scare you into needing their services and surprise you with a really expensive invoice. So we try to be transparent, we try to be responsive, we try to be efficient. Um, so a lot of things that we do, we leverage technology, we're mostly digital practice. Um, we leverage co-working spaces and working remotely to keep costs down. And we really run everything through sort of four core values, which are authenticity, creativity, empowerment, and joy. And so we try to make sure that everything we do reflects those values. Well, that's beautiful. I had no idea. I mean... I just thought that, you know, you were lawyers with a pretty face and a pretty appearance, but this is really cool. Well, I'll this take is... the compliments too. Thanks for the, the pretty face. But yeah, we, <laughs> you know, we're trying to do it a little bit differently. We want to make sure that, um, you know, we, we like to have interns every semester too, so that we can show them that you can do it this way and you can practice law this way and it doesn't have to be the old rigid way of doing it. And so we're hopeful that sooner or later we will sort of, create a new generation of lawyers and a new way to practice. And we actually, we formed a nonprofit organization called the Legal Unicorn Society. And the goal of that organization is to group together like-minded attorneys that are doing it like we're doing it. And hopefully have one of those lawyers or more in every state in the US and then ultimately all over the world. So that's, hopefully there will be more of us with the pretty face and the cool brand here soon enough. Now, let me just open up your website because I think that people need to see this Sure. We're Appreciate just, that. We're just like you, but lawyers. I really like this picture. And, you know, when I was looking through your website, I was like, lawyer shit? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we might actually try to trademark that soon because the, the U.S. Supreme Court is going to hear a case about lewd and offensive trademarks. And okay. if, they, yeah, if they start to allow those types of trademarks, we want to get that registered. I understand. It makes sense. And also yeah. the merch, I mean, you know, probably um, we should have a conversation about this maybe at another time, because as a designer, I'm also very interested in see how you guys translate something that it's conceptual into, you know, something that becomes visual and sellable as a product. So kudos yeah, to you well, guys. I will say there's not too many of our merchandise products that, that sell, but we've sold a couple of them. Okay, okay. Uh, listen, I believe that by now my listeners will be very confused as of why am I making this video. So I'm gonna try to give you a little bit of a backstory. Basically, one day I was in an airplane and I was looking at one of these magazines, you know, that you go, that you see on a, on a plane. And at the back, I saw a picture that a friend of mine did for a architectural competition. And then I was like... I know that this guy did this picture, but it was for an architect. How is this now on the magazine? Did they ask him to put it here? This is fantastic. I was honestly really excited for him. Then I started to talk to him and he was like, what the fuck? 
Like, he, <laughs> <laughs> it was like, this picture was sold to an architect to win a project, and then they took it and they put it on a magazine to sell the, the, the new brand, the new identity of the place. Uh, long story short, you know, he did not authorize that. Anyway, um, then a couple of days after, somebody came to me and said, oh, I've had a similar problem. Uh, what do you think I should do? And then, coincidentally, I saw a video of a guy that was talking about optimizing earnings as an artist. And one of the biggest problems is that artists leave a lot of money on the table because they don't understand copyright laws. Um, so, you know, a conversation that I was having with Mike Golden, I don't know if you know the guy. I think he, so. He was the one that suggested me to talk to you guys. And I was like, okay, we need to probably get to the bottom of this. Also because personally I work as a business consultant and this is one of the things that nobody has ever asked me since 2014. That's the reason we are here. So now I'm going to ask you a few questions and I'm gonna pretty much leave the stage to you. Okay, cool. Yeah. So I have to do my lawyerly duty and say that everything that I'll talk about on this interview is not legal advice. Please don't act on it without consulting an attorney first. And most of the laws that I'll be referencing are U.S. and California laws. Uh, it, this is very important that you're saying. And also some people might say, okay, so these laws don't apply to me. I have seen that in the past, things that were related, say, to the way business was done, taxation, you know, uh, all that kind of stuff was pretty much the same everywhere. There were some differences, but, you know, the concept more or less was the same. Yeah, the general framework is mostly consistent throughout most of the developed nations. And so it'll be, you know, there'll be small nuances for EU and different countries and things like that. But for the most part, it's it's the general framework that we'll be talking about. You can really tell that you're a lawyer. Your words are beautiful. <laughs> Thanks. Also, as an Italian, you know, I can get away with a lot of like mistakes, but you're you're doing this beautifully. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Sam, let's get started. In a nutshell, what are copyright laws and how do they work? Yeah, great question. So there's a bunch of different types of what the law and the world call intellectual property. Copyright is going to be one of them. Um, copyright is not the same as trademark and it is not the same as patent. And actually copyright uh, is a bundle of rights. It's not just sort of one type of right. It's actually something that applies to any type of idea or concept that's an original authorship and is fixed in a tangible medium. So a great example of that is going to be Harry Potter. You know, when she came up with Harry and Hogwarts and all of those different things that are so awesome, they weren't protectable until she actually put them into a written form in the book. And then once she did that, she automatically had copyright protection in that and the rights to sort of use those bundle of rights. And so things that are included in those bundle of rights are going to be the right to um, license that out for making films like she did with Universal or the right to license out the ability to make derivative works, which could be products or the films or other types of works like there's a Harry Potter dictionary now. Um, so those are all types of things that you get the ability to use, but then also you can protect anything that's protected by copyright and that's one of the things that you get along with that. And so that means, you know, preventing anybody else from writing the same Harry Potter books and claiming them as their own and making a profit off of that. Okay. And this is something that you gain by nature. Like the moment that you produce it, it's yours. You don't have to register. You don't have to. Yeah. So you actually get there. You can kind of think of it as like a spectrum. And that's true of any intellectual property. As soon as you create something and you use it, so with copyright, as soon as she wrote that book, or in the example of your friend, as soon as he took that photo, those people, those authors of those works actually have what are called common law rights in that work. And so that allows them to protect that work. The reason I say it's a spectrum is that it's not as strong of a protection and as strong of rights as if you actually register it. And so once you then register a copyright, the benefit there is that it provides some extra protections and some extra damages if you ever had to sue someone. 
but also it gives you the ability to point to that that registration whoever registered it you know in the u.s it's the federal copyright office and you can point to that registration and say hey look this is the date that i registered this and then from that date forward it's basically presumed that you have the exclusive rights to that and anybody else that uses it or tries to use it they have to show that they made it first and that you don't have those rights so having that registration allows you to point to that date and time which makes it a little bit easier to protect i understand but obviously this is not viable for say a client product say somebody is asking you to make a picture for them you wouldn't necessarily go and register the copyright because it's not worth it right i'm guessing well, that it might be you could yeah you could so so copyright is actually one of the cheaper intellectual property applications at least here in the okay. u.s it's either a 35 dollar or a 55 dollar mm -hmm. application fee so it's it's pretty inexpensive you know trademarks are hundreds of dollars and patents are thousands of dollars so it's the least expensive registration. However, in that example, you know, it'll really depend on what those two parties agreed on. You know, the photographer, if he agreed when he was hired that he gets to keep the rights and the ownership to that image, then he might want to copyright it because then maybe he can use it later in other periodicals or magazines or newspapers. Um, but if he doesn't have the right to the ownership of that, then he wouldn't be allowed even to register it because whoever hired him would own it and they would be the ones that could go register it. Okay, I think that we have a couple of questions where we're going to touch on this again. But anyway, let me move to the next question because I think that they are in a way very well connected to each other. We often hear some clients use the expression fair use when, for instance, using our work for other purposes other than what we have sold our work for. Can you explain what fair use is and how does it work? Sure. So the fair use doctrine uh, is essentially created to allow for the free use of copyrighted work within some specific sort of criteria and parameters. And the idea here is that copyright law really is intended to both help people protect their work, but also to create a framework to allow people and foster the creation of new work. And so the fair use doctrine sort of feeds into that second one. It allows you to take work that's protected by copyright and use it in certain ways to create new work. And so some examples of that are, you know, fair use is going to be fair, generally speaking, when it's um, one or more of these four different things. So the first one is if it's transformative, and I'll explain a little bit more about each of these, but if it's transformative, if it is, uh, depending on the nature of the original work, um, it can be fair use. And then how much of the original work and how substantial that piece that you're using is, and then also the impact of your use of that work. And so to describe each of those, so transformative, if you're going to take a work, like I used an earlier example of the Harry Potter dictionary. So the Harry Potter dictionary actually wasn't considered to be fair use because all of the words that it was, you know, explaining in the dictionary were actually already used in the Harry Potter books. And so it wasn't transformative because they were already sort of explained and in the Harry Potter books. So a good example of something transformative, on the other hand, would be, let's say you took like a two second news clip and then you made an art exhibit where it was on a bunch of TVs playing at different intervals and, you know, created an overall different impression and work. That would be transformative use of that two second news clip. So that goes actually to the next one, too, which is the nature of the original work. If the original work was fact-based, so like a news story or some type of periodical that is just explaining science or fact, it is a lot more acceptable to use those types of works in something else because disseminating facts to the public is a public service. So copyright wants to have people you know, share those facts. Whereas if it's a fictional work, that's something that somebody created, it came out of their mind, and there's no public service in using that again for your own work. And so that's transformative and then nature of the original work and then the amount and the substantial substantiality so the amount of the work you use so i said a two second news clip the the smaller amount of the work let's say that news story was uh 20 minutes and you only use two seconds since that's such a small portion that leads towards fair use as well and then the the catch there though is if you took let's say a one minute clip from that 20 minute news story and that one minute was like the heart of the news story. And then you were literally using that as like the heart of your work. That's probably not going to be considered fair use. 
And then the last one, the impact of the use. So in the example of fiction, again, if you take somebody else's fictional work and then you use it and you're using a lot of it and it's very substantial and, you know, you're, you're not doing it in a way that's very transformative, then you're actually depriving that original author and that original artist of their ability to monetize that and use that in a commercial way because you're now using it in a commercial way. So the impact of that use isn't fair. So that wouldn't fall under fair use. And there are some limited circumstances where using something for profit, because most of fair use is going to be for non-commercial uses or, you know, like documentary films is a big thing that you can rely on fair use for. So if you're going to use it for profit, there's less of an ability to rely on these factors. If all of these factors lean towards fair use really heavily and you're, and you're using it for profit, then that still might be considered fair. It's just harder to prove that it's fair use under for profit uses. Okay, I understand, because this is something that always happens, or at least I hear it happen in the YouTube stratosphere, you know? YouTube, they're monetized videos, and when people copy parts of other people's videos, YouTube kind of tend to let it go, also because other users see that as a free publicity, but in theory, somebody can actually call and give you a strike and say, no, this is like copyright uh, abuse. And that's a good point, because sometimes what happens is when you use somebody else's work, if your work gets really popular, it could actually help that original author make more money off of it. So sometimes if, you know, the claim is, oh, well, you're impacting their ability to monetize it, but it actually improves their ability to do so, then the impact of the use actually weighs in favor of fair use. And at the end of the day, with intellectual property, the only person or the only party that is going to bring up an infringement issue is the original owner. And so if they're benefiting off of it, chances are they're not going to claim any issue there anyway. So, Okay, this is very good. Um, just one more example re related to this. A friend of mine made a flashy video for his own portfolio. Now, one of the companies that make smartphones in China saw this video and decided to use it as a music video to play at the launch of a new smartphone. They did not give the credit, they did not pay any money. Still, this company claimed that it was fair use. How do you feel about this? I would definitely argue that that's not fair use. And I think, you know, I mean, China is notorious for theft of intellectual property. And so that's just a, a very egregious example, unfortunately. Um, but, you know, one of the things that I always like to talk about with my clients is that there's sort of two ways to look at any of these situations. There's always going to be the legal, but then there's going to be the practical, too. And in that example, you know, that Chinese company is probably a, a Goliath and, it, and it's probably very difficult to then say, well, I'm going to sue you for copyright infringement, not to mention um, the cost alone is going to be a lot. But then we're talking about different countries, laws and international laws and treaties. And so, unfortunately, the practical implications sometimes are that it's just prohibitive to try to do something about that. And I think that's why you see big companies and, and companies in China specifically decide that they don't care because there's not a lot that people can do about it sometimes. Okay, let's go back for a second to copywriting and let's weigh, you know, the pros and cons. Is it important for a designer or an artist to copyright their work? And what would you say it's the easiest way to go on about? Is it a contract? Is it registering their work? Yeah, so I think, you know, there's there's different types of copyright. You know, you can get a copyright on a website design. You can get a copyright on a type of jewelry. You can get a copyright on certain fashion things. But you can also get a copyright on photos and books and screenplays like we've talked about. And I think that for some of those, it makes a lot more sense to copyright it. For instance, like a book and a photo and a screenplay, those are types of things that are probably going to stay relatively static. They're not going to change too much. And so getting the copyright for those, it's going to protect it because it's not going to change. Whereas jewelry, you know, by the time you get a copyright, it could be six or eight months. And by the time you get the copyright protection for that piece of jewelry, the, the fashion might change and then you have to change the design and you have a new one. So sometimes I don't think it makes sense to do copyright for things like that or like a web page, for instance, that can change very fluidly. So I think sometimes it doesn't make sense to spend the money on those types of registrations for copyright um, because of the nature of them. And then 
as far as how to go about doing it, in the U.S. at least, it's a pretty straightforward application. You can do it online. Um, you go through a number of different pages and prompts, and you just enter the information. Um, they, it's pretty cool because you can also sort of indicate that in some of the examples we've talked about, you can indicate, oh, I hired this person to create this, and they are the original author. However, I own this now, and I'm filing the copyright. Because then that's cool, and it actually gives some credit to the artist or the original author. Um, and then, like I had said earlier, it's usually like $35 for an application or sometimes $55 for the application. Um, and then you have to submit some evidence of, you know, you submit the photos or you submit whatever it is, the content that you're registering. Um, and then it takes, you know, a few months, six, sometimes eight months for them to approve it. And then you have a copyright certificate. You can look online to see that it's been registered. And a lot of the time when you register something in the U.S. first, it actually allows you then to have a priority registration in other places like the EU or other countries around the world. Is it also the other way around? Um, sometimes. So it, it's there's a lot of different um, bodies of law or, or, or um, offices that, that do registration. So for instance, there's something called the Madrid Protocol. The Madrid Protocol covers a number of different countries around the world. And if you register under the Madrid Protocol, you're registered in all of those countries. This is more for trademark, but there's similar things for copyright. Um, there's the World Intellectual Property Organization. There's a way to register through that. But then each country itself has its own registration body as well. So sometimes if you register in another place, it has priority like that for the U.S., um, but it depends on which one you pick, how you register it, things like that. Okay, so let's just, you know, uh, sidetrack for a second because I want to ask you something. Uh, if I have a company and I have a logo for my own company, do I need to copyright that logo or the fact that I have a company and a website and a, a branding and everything, does that guarantee me the right to keep that or can somebody just come and copy it because I did not register it? Yeah, good question. So a logo would actually be a trademark. So the difference is there being that a trademark is essentially a source identifier. So you can think of like the Nike swoosh or the Lacoste alligator, things like that. And so trademarks, it's similar. Once you use it publicly in relation to the goods or services, so, you know, if you throw it up on the website and, you know, it's, it's there for people to see in line with your business consulting services or design services, um, then you have common law rights in that trademark. And so, again, that means that you are able to protect it and stop other people from using it. However, common law rights for trademark are only sort of geographically specific. So, the benefit of registering a trademark, on the other hand, as opposed to copyright, is that you then get more broad protection. So if you register a trademark in the U.S., it's protected in all of the states in the U.S. And then if you register with, like, the, the WIPO, the World uh, Intellectual Property Organization, or the Madrid Protocol, you get protection in all of the countries or wherever it governs. And so with trademark, then that allows you to say, I can protect this in all of those places, not just in my geographic region. And so the difference with registration just being that once you use it, you do have rights in it, and you can um, technically reach out to someone anywhere and say, hey, I have this, I used it first. But if they're savvy enough or if they have lawyers and they see that you don't have it registered, they'll say, oh, well, you only have it protected where you are, not everywhere. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of the, the long, and long story short of the trademark. Um, but it, 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 there's benefits to registration for sure because – in addition to allowing you to have that more broad protection, it also gives you sort of default damages. So if you were to ever sue someone for either copyright or uh, trademark infringement, and you won, you're automatically guaranteed a certain amount of monetary damages because you had it registered, because then the presumption is that people know that you're protecting it, and so they're intentionally infringing. Okay, I understand. Wow. Uh, okay, so say just uh, out of curiosity, what would it cost to register the Nike logo? Yeah, so usually you want to start with a trademark search. And so the trademark search, we charge $200, and then we give everyone a report that lists out all the marks that might be problematic because with, with trademarks, you have to make sure that nobody else is using a similar mark or a similar trademark first. And so, you know, like if we ran a search on the trademark swoosh, we would obviously say to our client, don't register that, Nike's going to come after you. But if there wasn't any other Nike swoosh out there, then we would say, okay, this looks good. Let's register it. And then in the U.S., um, it's $275 per class. Trademarks are broken down into 45 different classes. So 
Um, each class groups together goods or services. So for instance, like class 25 is like t-shirts and clothing and accessories. Class 45 would be legal services. Like we would register lawyer shit in class 45. And then, um, you know, selling merchandise online would be class 35. And these classes all are pretty old. So sometimes there's issues with lots of different things being in the same class. And that makes it difficult. For instance, like class 41 is education, entertainment, blogs, video production. It's a lot of different things. And so it can be hard to be distinct within that class, which is what you need in order to get registered because there can be a Nike plumbing, which is going to be a totally different class than the Nike goods and clothing and accessories. And that's allowed because like with copyright trademark also wants to encourage and foster the ability to have lots of different business names and trademarks, but that's why it has to be only distinct within its class. And so, um, yeah, the fees, in the U.S., you know, usually you do the, the search and there's lots of different pricing for all this stuff, but you do a search for us, $200 flat fee, 300 per logo. And then the application itself, we charge $500 and then 150 per additional class. And then again, the USPTO charges 275 per class. So, you know, like a one class application with us, including the search would be 975. Now to do, so like, let's say we get you registered in the U.S. and then we want to go register internationally that's going to be a lot more expensive because we need to do another search because we want to search all of those countries and all of those places and then all of the application fees. And so for instance, like a, I looked recently and I think it was for a one class application with the world intellectual property organization in like three countries, something like that. It was around $3,000. So it gets more expensive, the more, you know, broad your protection will be. I guess that as long as you do good work and you build the name, even if people try to rip you off, they're only trying to steal your, you know, I name and identity. To a certain extent, I think that it's already enough if you register in your own country and don't really worry about what others try to do in other places, because eventually if you become big enough, then later on you can go and sue them. <laughs> Yeah, well, and hey, imitation's the sincerest form of flattery, right? So I feel like, you know, a lot of the time when people do that, um, it's really just about how, what type of approach you want to take when you see somebody using your your mark out there. If, if it's diverting customers, that's a whole different story, you know? Do you know the story of the South Butt? No. That was the, uh, a brand that was trying to rip off the North Face. So they made the South butt and they uh, swapped the logo upside down and the guy became That's actually really wealthy and then North Face went after him. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I, I would be interested to see if North Face won that because that sounds to me a lot like um, this sort of exception to most of the rules we're talking about called parody. Yeah. Anytime you do something that's supposed to be humorous, for the most part, as long as it's not... Um, you know, inflammatory or like, you know, super offensive. Most parody is, but there's a fine line you have to walk there. But usually parody is kind of like an exception to the rule for most intellectual mm -hmm. property. Have you ever seen the episode of Nathan for you, dumb Starbucks? Yes. I actually <laughs> went to that location. I went to the dumb Starbucks in LA. Uh, <laughs> me and a friend of mine, we went and got dumb lattes or whatever they were calling them. <laughs> Genius. Okay, yeah, it's great. let me go back a little bit to uh, copyright. I will. I would like to ask you, um, people that do the job that I try to cater for in terms of information and so on, they're, they basically work under three main format. One is freelance, the other one is medium-sized company, and the third one is big, large corporate office. Now, one of the most common misconceptions is that copyright laws are just for big companies. If you're doing work for clients, like, you know, you make pictures of, uh, for architects, do you have to copyright your work? Do you have to write it in your contract that your work is your own property? How does this work? Is it something that it's only for the big players or is there a way also for the small guys to protect themselves? Yeah, so definitely. I would say it's definitely not just for the big players. It's certainly important, and that's kind of what is involved in the fabric of copyright and trademark and all these intellectual property, is that it is supposed to at least help people ensure that they can create things and, and know that once they create them, they can protect them. And so in the in the examples that you provided, you know, I'll start with the easiest one. So anytime you're an employee, anytime you're employed by a company, 
and you create anything that's intellectual property, for the most part, as a default, anything you create while you're working for them, they own. And the idea there is that because they're your employer and they provide you with all kinds of benefits, you know, withholdings for taxes and they're, they're employing you and they're paying you. The idea then is that because they give you all those benefits, something that they get in return is anything you create related to their business, they would own. And so that one's pretty straightforward. You know, there's, there's certain ways to try to like exempt stuff that you work on. You know, if you don't work on it on their time with their equipment and it's not related to the business, they're probably not going to own that. Uh, but moving out of that, you know, anytime someone is just hired like a freelancer or anytime there's a contract to hire someone to do photography or design work or anything like that, those people need to make sure that their agreement's very clear and also that both parties understand what's in that agreement. Because one of the things that happens really often is that people just don't understand these things. And it's not, not always something that is, you know, nefarious or like someone really has a, a sketchy intent and they want to steal stuff. They just don't understand and a lot of the time, too, what happens is, is these freelancers end up working with the legal department of a big company. And then the legal department doesn't really get the creative services industry. And so the artist doesn't get the legal industry. And then they're missing each other on that communication. And so it's important to make sure that there's really two types of scenarios that you can see in an agreement. And again, when you're not an employee, the agreement is really what's going to dictate who owns what. And so if there's nothing in an agreement or there's no agreement at all, Whoever's hired, whoever is the author, whoever creates that intellectual property, the photographer, the designer, they own it unless there's an agreement that says who hired them owns it, which is counterintuitive to a lot of people. They think, well, I hired that person. I should own it. But you're only hiring them at arm's length with a contract. So it's not like an employer employee. So you have to make sure that either a license is in the agreement or ownership and ownership's usually an assignment. Um, you always hear work made for hire. That's an assignment of ownership. Um, in, in California, they're moving away from work made for hire. It's going to be, you have to use assignment language instead. That's nerdy lawyer stuff, but essentially it's assignment or a license. And so a license is, let's say I take a bunch of photography let's say I, you know, I shoot photography at your wedding and I take all those photos and then I give you a license only to use those photos for your personal use, you know, in your home and with your family and your friends. But then you go and you sell a bunch of those photos to a wedding registry or, to a magazine about weddings. Well, I only gave you a license to use those for your personal use. When you went and sold those images, that actually wasn't allowed. And so you could take action on that as the photographer because when you give a license, I would still own those photos because I only gave a license and I didn't assign ownership. So I can actually revoke that license and say, look, you didn't follow that. You breached this agreement. You owe me more money. I need the money from the sale or whatever the case. And then a, an assignment on the other hand is let's say I shot that wedding and I have all those those photos and I assign ownership to the bride and groom. Well, they can then do whatever they want with those photos because they own them and they have all the rights, but then I can no longer use them at all unless sometimes, you know, you'll get a license as the photographer to use them on your like portfolio and to promote yourself. But that's the reverse, right? I'm giving them ownership and they're giving me a license to then be able to use them in a limited way. I understand. This is very complex and complicated mainly because it can get very complicated and also because i think that you know in our case a lot of people are happy to get a job they don't want to complicate their life even further by saying to their clients you can only do this with the images that we give you right right but that's why yeah, we need to bargaining power you know it's when you're trying to negotiate with a big company and you need to make money because you're a freelancer and you don't want to rock the boat it's hard, but at the, at the same time, you know, you can find yourself in a situation where, like, for instance, that architecture photo that we started the conversation with, that whoever, you know, that magazine's probably making a bunch of money. And if, if originally the photographer would have agreed for royalties or something like that, they'd be receiving a check every month for however much money. And so as much as it's like, I don't want to rock the boat, at the same time, you might kick yourself later if you didn't, you know, do that at the, at the outset. I understand. Okay, so... Let's be a little bit practical about this. When it comes to stipulating a contract between an artist and a client, what is important to include from a copyright perspective? And let's focus on the artist uh, part because, you know, um, clients, they very often in this field get the better end of the stick. We want to help 
artists and we want to empower them? Sure. Yeah. So I would say that it's sometimes it's hard because you really have to have that conversation, like I said, with whoever's hiring you as the artist, because you have to understand whether they expect to get ownership, you know, the assignment of the rights, or if they expect a license. And, and the reason that that's important to discuss and then put in the contract is that if they're expecting ownership, but you're only charging them for a license, that could become a problem. Because in my mind, you should charge less for a license and more for ownership because license is limited. They only use it for something and an ownership, they get everything and they can do whatever they want with it. And so if you're not on the same page and it's not written clearly into the agreement that you're giving one or the other, then later on, like, let's say you gave a license and they start using it however they want. Well, A, it's going to be hard to pursue them if they're a big company because they have more money. But B, also, then you should have charged more originally. So the idea is to make sure that whatever you put into the contract is clear between the parties and then that it's, that it's correctly written and memorialized in the contract. And so if you're talking with someone and you say, yeah, I'll, I'll give it to you for just this use, then you have to make sure that license lays out that they only get it for that use. Whereas if you're talking to them and they say, oh, well, we want ownership. You go, oh, okay, well, that's this much more money. And they go, okay, great, that's fine. We want ownership. Then you have to make sure that the agreement has that assignment in it and they get the ownership of it. And then for you as the artist, if you give ownership, if you have assignment in your agreement, you can't then go use those images anymore because you don't own them. But if you give a license, you can use them however you'd like. So, and this is also not including something that, that gets factored into this stuff, which is like, for photos, at least, if you do photos, there's other rights because if someone is in the photo, you need the permission from that person to use their image and likeness. So it can get very complicated very quickly because there's very different, you know, very many levels of, of rights. Um, you know, other things like design work and things like that, that can happen too because if you do, if you design a website or something like that, you probably need a license from Squarespace or WordPress or any of those things. And so there's a lot of different rights that go into these things. And so the important things to have in the contract are going to be just setting all those expectations out clearly. And so, for instance, as an artist, if I'm hired to take photos, I need to know whether or not they expect to own them. And if they do, I should charge more. That should all be in the agreement. Is there and a then formula? Also, Is there a formula to kind of calculate the, uh, the value? Not really. No, so not really. I wish there was. But, you know, I think and, and I can get on my personal soapbox about this a little bit, but You know, for instance, like if you do a photography contract and it's just an event, it's most likely going to be a lot less money than if it's a wedding, just because the wedding industry tends to be a little bit up-priced. Um, and so, you know, there, maybe there's a formula in that regard that if, depending on the industry, it might be different, but um, not, not so much. And, but so in that example, though, you know, if, if I'm shooting a wedding, I should put in my agreement with the bride and groom or whoever my client is, the parents, that they are responsible for getting the image and likeness releases from all of the people at the wedding that I'm going to take photos of because I can't go up to each person and ask them to sign a release and they're not people that I know. So that's not my responsibility. And so I should clearly lay that out in the agreement that it is not my responsibility so that then later on, if I sell a photo or if they use a photo and someone old granny at the wedding says, I don't want to be in those images Well, that wasn't my responsibility to get her permission. It was actually theirs. And so she should take it up with them. That's very clear and it makes a lot of sense. And actually, there is one of the questions that it's going to touch back on this because, you know, it, it can get, it can add a lot of layers of complication. Um, okay, I'll ask you the question then. How does copyright affect me in my work if I have to use the work of other artists? The example sure. could be that, you know, I'm creating a picture of a 3D building, so I'm working with my computer, and what I put inside my computer is a picture of another photographer. So it's a photographer that maybe I hired to, you know, make a picture for my background. How do I manage such a situation? What do I owe to the photographer? What are my limitations? What can I do then with the work that I produce? Right. Yeah. So that's a good example because if, for instance, if you hired them and in your agreement, you were given ownership, that's really all you're good then because you can use that image however you want. You know, if you want to be respectful, you should credit that artist with the image because it's always good for them to get that publicity and that promotion. 
But if you didn't hire them, let's say you just found an image and you wanted to use it. Well, I always like to say, you know, put yourself in the shoes of whoever created that intellectual property. If, you know, you took that photo and then like your friend saw it in a magazine and they didn't give permission, that sucks. And so what I say is always try to put yourself in their shoes first. And if it's a situation where you didn't hire that person, because if you hired them and, you know, you have a good contract in place, all those rights are already laid out. And it's clear. But if that's not the situation, then put yourself in their shoes. If, if you would feel upset about someone using your work like you plan to use that work, then maybe just reach out to them, you know, reach out and ask for permission. They might try to charge you a license fee or something like that. And then that really just becomes whether or not it's worth it for you to pay that. Um, you know, that's up to you and them to negotiate. And then on the point of a building, actually, it's a good one to, to use as an example because buildings can be copyrighted. So a building itself can have a copyright and sometimes even a trademark. But so if, and, and it gets really complicated with copyright as far as like how buildings are protected. It's usually after a certain year if they're no longer protected and, and, and before that. So what I would say with that is in that specific example, it's always good if you want to make a building that's like a real world building to change some of it. You know, you can have it be reminiscent of the original building, but you'll want to change it so it's not identical because then technically that might be transformative like we talked about earlier. And then you're not sort of infringing on the copyright of that building. So actually, I could also get in trouble if, say, an architect is asking me to, you know, make a picture of his own building and I uh, reproduce the buildings on the side. That could be an offense because you're actually using their. Oh, my God. I see why. Only people... <laughs> if you don't have their permission. Only if you don't have their permission. That, and, and so make sure that permission's in writing so that if anything ever happens later on, you can say, no, look, here I have. They said I could do this. I see. Okay, I see how this can be complicated. Um, all right, let's move to the next question. We'll have to make sense of all of this later. If you're, well, I'll add something real quick. Yes. So, real quick, it, it, it's it's important to mention that for most intellectual property, I touched on this earlier. To try to sue someone or for someone to try to sue you over it, it's very expensive. So, you know, going back to the legal and the practical, legally speaking, there may be infringement and, and it may be actionable in a court of law. However, trying to file that action and fight it, it can be hundreds of thousands of dollars or more. And so sometimes what ends up happening is you try your best to reach out, get someone to stop doing what they're doing, or someone reaches out to you and they want you to stop. And there's a lot of threats going back and forth or negotiation. But if ultimately no one wants to budge, sometimes it's just too expensive to pursue it further. And so it's really about trying to arrange and negotiate something between the parties. And then if that doesn't work, calling someone's bluff and saying, well, you're not actually going to go to court over this or hoping that someone's not actually going to go to court over it if you're on the receiving end. Um, so, and that's, but you know, that's not always true. Big companies have the money to do it. Sometimes attorneys will take it on a contingency basis and things like that where they get paid if you win. So that's not always a for sure thing, but it's worth mentioning that it's very expensive to try to pursue a legal action over these types of things. I understand. I think that probably the reason why uh, we're having this conversation is to make people aware of the fact that when they produce something, they retain certain rights because those rights allow you to optimize, first of all, the amount of money that you can earn with the work that you produce. Because, you know, if your work is reused or if it's like abused by your client, you know, if your client uses it and then changes it and then gives you the credit and say that you did it, you know, you can actually go back to the client and say, look, this is damaging my persona, you know? Exactly. Same goes on the other side. If uh, uh, one of the things that I say to my clients when they're not happy about the images that they produce for the clients, I tell them, look, make also the image that you think looks better and say to the client, we'll give it to you as a gift, part of the package that we're selling you, because then it becomes legally uh, a product that you sold and that can be displayed as your portfolio. But this is something that I don't know how it works from a legal point of view. It just makes sense from a practical point of view. You know what I mean? Yeah, and it's always good, I think, to add here that, that one way to make sure that you can, like you said, protect and, and make sure you can monetize and, and use the stuff that you create is anytime it's a trademark. So again, source identifier like the word Nike or the swoosh, um, you know, put a little TM. You've seen that before, the little TM. There's 
there's the TM and then there's the R in the yes. circle. The R in the circle can only be used when you do have a trademark registration and you can actually get in trouble if you use that without a registration. But the TM is when you don't have a registration and you are protecting that trademark or pursuing registration. So the TM is really good to use because that's actually going to be considered legal notice to people that you protect that. So if they then, if you can prove that they saw your mark and that it had the TM on it, then they're intentionally infringing, which is worse for them. Same goes with copyright, the little C in the circle. You can use that without registration or when you do have registration. And so with copyright, always good to put the little C in the circle on anything that is a copyright type of work because then that's the same. If somebody then infringes, you can point to that and say, look, they knew that I was protecting this. They're intentionally infringing, which again, that's worse for them. Okay. Let me move to the next question also because I've been keeping you for 48 minutes already. <laughs> yeah, no worries. I, I have an hour for us, so we're good. We still have a little bit left. Listen, if you're hired by a company to work on a project in-house or if you're an employee of a company that produces creative work such as illustrations, what is the best way for the single individual to retain the right to use the creative work produced during that time and i'm asking this because it's very difficult for some artists to get hired by other companies if they don't have the right to you know show their work to the competition so to say sure so i'd say there's really two main ways to ensure that you as the creator of the work still have some rights to it and the freedom to use it to promote yourself and, and even sell it and things like that so the first one is that you give them only a license. So, you know, in the agreement that you're hired in, you give them only a license and then you retain all ownership. That would allow you to show other people your work, put it in your portfolio, promote yourself, even sell it and license it to others for other monetary purposes. And so that's when you retain ownership and only give a license. So presumably that means that the company that hired you is paying less because they're only getting a license to use it for X, Y, and Z. Now, the other way would be where they pay more and they get ownership but you would ask for a license back from them in return. So you give them all ownership and then they give you a license to use it in your portfolio to promote yourself or whatever you agree on with them. And so, you know, you'd specifically say, hey, look, as an artist, this is my, my livelihood. So I need to be able to show this as a portfolio and promote myself to others to get hired like you guys hired me. So can I have a license to do that? And, you know, if they have ownership and they're reasonable and they understand that, they should give you that license. And then that would allow you to do that as well. Because there are companies that they will also put in your contract that you cannot work for two years for a similar company afterward. But I think that this kind of non-compete can only exist if you're being paid not to work for others, if I don't mistake. It's very specific to where you are with non-compete. So for instance, in California, non-competes are not valid. You cannot, com you cannot hold someone to a non-compete. There are very limited exceptions to that. It's usually when you're a business owner and you sell your business, things like that. Sometimes there'll be non-competes that are upheld, but non-competes in California are typically just void as a matter of public policy because California wants people to have the freedom to go out and, and you know, do business and have commerce. And so it's very specific. Like uh, for instance, New York is the other way around. New York will enforce non-competes. So um, it's, it's very difficult sometimes to look at non-competes and enforce them because it depends on where people are, where they sign the agreement, where the company is located, you know, all of those types of things. I have one more question and then, uh, I will thank you for your time. This is though a very open question and I'm sure that we will have to go through it to kind of explain it, but you know, um, in the event of an artist or a designer delivering a work without any copyright clauses, included in their contract, or sometimes even without a contract, how does the law see this? Who is favored in case of a dispute? Because in some countries like Romania, you basically have the rights of ownership forever. You cannot even like sell them from what I understood. So like, you can sell a license to do whatever, but the ownership stays with you. What is your experience? Yeah. yeah, so usually in these situations, if it's a contract that's silent on ownership or there's no contract at all, it's going to be that the artist retains all of that ownership. 
And so um, probably similar to how it is in Romania then, because it's the idea there is that as the artist, you should have, and it goes back to kind of like the intent behind these laws, right? And copyright wants people to be able to be free to create things and then have the confidence that if they create them, they can protect them because as an artist, if you create something, but then you're like, oh, all the laws are terrible and I can't protect anything that I create, why would you continue to create? Or maybe you would create, but you wouldn't share it. And then we don't have art as we know it because art is about sharing. And so in in these situations, if there's no contract or the co contract is silent on ownership, then you as the artist who created the work, you will own it. And that will just be flat out, that's the case. There are some situations that can get very involved, like if, um, you know, you have a bunch of conversations with someone and you say, yeah, this will be yours. It'll totally be yours once I shoot these photos or design this thing. It's all yours. And then once you, you know, establish that and then you're done and you say, no, it's mine. I don't want you to have it. Well, that's a different scenario because technically you had an oral agreement or an implied agreement. And if you then go back on that agreement, that could be something where you're essentially that was fraud because you, you fraudulently induced them into the relationship and promised them something that then you refused. And so we could get down into the, the weeds on this, but essentially um, if you rely on an oral agreement to your detriment, then usually you can enforce that oral agreement. So in that scenario, like if I was hired by someone, I said, everything that we do, you're going to get, it's yours. And then later I said, no, you need to pay me a million dollars to get all of that. Well, that other party could say, no, you, you lied to me then and, and you induced me into this contract and now you're holding that stuff hostage. And because I expected to have this stuff and I paid you money for it already, I relied on it to my detriment. And so they may be able then to win on an oral agreement or an implied agreement basis. But, you know, this is a little bit of an oversimplification, but that's an example of how that stuff I can go. I totally get it. I totally get it. Okay, so let me sum it up very quickly because I have to let you go soon. If I'm making work for a client, in my contract, I would have to write that the project that I'm making, whatever it is, pictures, 3D models, is licensed for the type of work that they're requesting. Anything else, right. they will have to ask me for permission and in case, pay me usage rights. Right. If, right. if I'm a commission to illustrate the next opera house for Sydney and that picture is going to go everywhere, I'll go and register my work as copyrighted. That would be smart, yes. Okay, I think we cracked the system. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. I hope this is helpful for people out there. It was, it was fun. I think these were really good questions. Sam, thank you very much for taking the time. I really appreciate it and I hope that people at home will appreciate it also. Um, I'm going to link all everything that is relevant to this conversation, your website and everything, your LinkedIn. Can people get in touch with you? Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. People can reach out on LinkedIn or we have our holler at wilkmaz.com. And then there's also a little pop-up box on our website that people can shoot us messages. And yeah, we're, we do free consultations, so we're happy to help. Okay, fantastic. Sam, thanks a lot again. I'm going to stop the recording. Don't go anywhere so that I can say thank you one more time. Sure. Okay? Thank you. Thank you.